Hi everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the next part of our um, study in physics, which is going to be work and energy. Now work and energy is a technique that we will use to solve mechanics that involves using an extension of Newton's second law. The key to understanding work and energy, and I'm going to start this out in the preface, is that everything in work and energy needs to define the system. And the system here is referring to uh, the, uh, a system is really defined by its boundary. And so I've got a little system here. And when we're discussing work, we're really talking about forces acting on a system from an environment. So everything outside a system is a environment. And everything inside the system here, this gumdrop and a, a little uh, rope uh, on it, that is a something that's inside the system. And the earth is inside the system as well. So I'm going to have to be very careful about when I talk about work and energy, describing what forces are inside the system and what forces are outside the system. And so I want to be clear. And so when you hear me say things like our system is or something like that, that's a very important thing here. And so really remember what defines a system is the boundary. And uh, then we say the things inside are in the boundary and outside are uh, the environment. So uh, given that as a preface, we're going to define work. Now work is the product uh, of the force acting on a system with the displacement that that system is moved. And the only part of the force acting in the same direction that the uh, system moves is going to contribute to the work. So if we imagine the case where we have a finger pressing on a book and sliding it horizontally across the table, shown here by the displacement and this force F, only the horizontal component of the force actually contributes to the work. The vertical component doesn't move the book in that direction, and therefore it does not do any work. If I push on something and the object doesn't move, no work is done on the system, which is a little counterintuitive given we think of work like working out and stuff like that. And that's the kind of thing where you can have a lot of uh, energy expected, uh, but you're not actually moving things about very much. So mathematically, we phrase this as uh, the work done is the force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So it's the component of the force in the direction of the displacement or uh, the component of the displacement that is projected along the force vector. So if I have this little block and it's pulled to the right by a force that's pointed up in this direction, we take the F cos theta component and then we have our uh, displacement in that direction. And that's how we define work. Uh, the energy of a system uh, uh, is changed by work. Uh, work is uh, uh, basically, and, or rather energy is really just kind of reductively described as the ability of a uh, system to do work, namely to move an object through some distance. And energy, this concept, uh, in, uh, we'll explore in so much detail over the next three or four weeks, uh, is going to be one of the most powerful tools that we have for studying physics, full stop, the concept of energy. But it derives fundamentally from Newton's second law. And uh, the unit of energy that we'll be working with is called a joule. Uh, so it is a force, Newton, moved through a distance, meter. And so that's one joule, which is the SI unit of uh, energy. And it's really just a compound uh, unit of the kilogram meter squared per second squared. Um, you're probably more familiar with the unit of energy uh, that's called a uh, calorie. Uh, that's the imperial unit of work. And one calorie is 4.184 joules. And you sort of think about food energy. Uh, if you look at a nutrition label here in the great nation of Canada, you will see that it is listed, it is listed in um, the energy is given in calories. But secretly, that is not 
calories, but that's kilocalories. So when you see something that's calorie and you're like, oh, this barely has anything energy in at all, it's really a kilocalorie. But if you go ahead and look at a nutrition label in a uh, country that is fully subscribed to the metric system, like the UK, you'll see that the food energy is actually listed in terms of kilojoules uh, and kilocalories here. So it's an equivalent of uh, the two cases, and they are proper with their metric prefixes in Britain. I would expect nothing less, uh, plus a bunch of other things that are uh, exciting. But the energy uh, in food is in uh, calories or in joules if you are in a sensible uh, system of units. So the general thinking of how work relates to energy is that positive work that is done on the system by the environment will increase that system's energy. And positive work done by the system on the environment will decrease that system's energy. And so this gives us, with these sort of words and frameworks, the tools that we need to start exploring the work and energy theorem. And that's the point of today's lecture. So uh, first off, let's think about what it means for a something in the environment to do work on a system. So in this case, I'm going to say that the system is my block here. I'm going to have an external force that is the force F, and it's going to move it through some displacement. The direction of this force matters. The force projected along the uh, displacement uh, vector uh, is in, it will have a positive component, so the work will be positive. And so this force will drag this block along and it will increase its energy. In contrast, if this object is in a, undergoing a displacement uh, to the right here, uh, and the direction of the work uh, vector or the force vector is pointing backwards with respect to the displacement, or it has a negative component in the x direction, then it's going to do negative work on the system, and this uh, negative work is going to take energy out of the system. Now, this all seems like I'm kind of burying the lead because we have a mechanical um, operation that we can apply that does exactly this. And that is the dot product. So we set this up a couple of weeks ago and I'm cashing that check right now. Uh, so the displacements and forces are vectors. And so we use the dot product to define the work. It is the force dotted with the displacement. And you'll remember that the uh, dot product is the magnitude of vector a b times the cosine of the angle between the uh, or the product of the three components here so this takes into account the idea that we get the projection and the direction of the vectors matter and that's encoded in the cosine of the angle between them so the dot product is exactly what we want to use to calculate the um uh, work done by the system, and then how it changes the energy. Okay, so this is all preamble. Let's talk about some actual physics uh, scenarios. Uh, this is an example courtesy of the illustrious Dr. Kaminsky, who let me um, know that uh, sometimes we have to pull a crate across a horizontal floor with a constant speed. Uh, it moves through a distance delta x, that's shown here. Uh, it's using a rope, which is making an angle theta with respect to the horizontal. Um, now, for the speed to be constant, the system has to be in equilibrium. There is no net acceleration. Therefore, the system is in equilibrium, so there must be a friction force opposing uh, the applied force. And we're going to give it a kinetic friction mu sub k. And we're going to just do some algebra here and use these variables to figure out uh, the object, uh, the uh, object uh, properties here. And so uh, Dr. Kaminsky has let us have several questions here all at once. Um, so let's start out by asking, how large is f in order for the speed to be constant? Well, oops, let's, let's put pen to paper. Uh, I have a free body diagram here. Uh, so I have a force. I have the normal force. It's already illustrated over here, but I like to actually have a proper free body diagram. Uh, we have mg, and that's about that. And then I need to have an equilibrium of forces. So I know that the sum of the forces in the x direction 
uh, where I will set up x and y has to be zero because it's in equilibrium. And then that's going to be f cos theta acting in the positive direction. So that's this component here, uh, minus the friction force. And we'll use our standard force model as mu k times the normal force there. Uh, the sum of the forces in the y direction, there's uh, three forces we have to deal with. Uh, the normal force points up, the vertical component of the force uh, that's pulling it uh, points up, and then mg points down, and that's also equal to zero because it's in equilibrium. So at this point, we can solve the bottom equation for the normal force and substitute it into the x equation. So I'm going to find the normal force from f of y, some of the forces in the y direction, gives us that the normal force is mg minus f sine theta. And then the uh, sum of, then the, um, x forces, some of the forces in the x direction, is going to give us that f cos theta uh, minus mu sub k times mg minus f sine theta equals zero. I'm going to collect all the terms with an f in them because I've got to do some algebra. So it's f times the cosine of theta uh, distribute the negative sign, so that's plus mu k sine theta minus mu k mg equals zero. I'll push the mu k mg over to the other side, f uh, cos theta plus mu k sine theta is equal to mu k mg. Cool. And then I get that the force is equal to mu k mg over cos theta plus mu k sine theta. Uh, so I've done my first one. Uh, everything is good. So I'm going to use a little bit of space here. Um, I'm going to actually going to lasso and bank my force expression because I'm going to need that later. Copy that, but don't do anything yet. So now I want to calculate the work done by the applied force. Well, uh, the applied force it has this magnitude f, but the only component that is done in the uh, displacement is in the uh, horizontal direction. So I can calculate f, oops, I can calculate f dot delta x as a vector is going to be f cos theta times delta x. And so then the uh, displacement or the work done is the work is equal to mu k m g cos theta over uh, cos theta plus mu k sine theta. Cool, that one's done. Uh, let's compute the work done by the normal force. So the normal force dotted with the displacement vector uh, is going to be the normal force times delta x times the cosine of 90 degrees because the normal force is pointed up the displacement is pointed perpendicular to it, so this whole mess is just going to be zero. Uh, well, what about by gravity? So this is uh, B, this was uh, C, uh, D, similar deal. Mg dotted with delta x is just going to be zero. They're perpendicular to each other. Life is good. And then the final thing is, what is the work done by friction? Well, the friction force... Um, Let's uh, go ahead and um, erase some stuff. I'm going to need my results here. I'm going to need that paste. I want my force expression here. And um, from that, I yeah, let's clean up this. this. So I get the force there. I also knew uh, from earlier that the uh, friction force has a uh, form that f cos theta minus mu k n equals zero, and this is the friction force, so mu k n is equal to f cos theta. Uh, in terms of magnitudes, I have my f and I have my cos theta here, and so, uh, sorry, I wrote mu k f because I was so excited to get over to the left-hand side of the equation, or the right-hand side, but it's mu k n 
is equal to f cos theta. And so the work done by friction is going to be uh, mu k n times delta x, which is equal to f cos theta uh, times delta x times the cosine of 180 degrees, because the angle between the displacement vector going this way and the friction going this way is 180 degrees, and the cosine of 180 is negative 1, so this is equal to negative f cos theta delta x. And then we want to know what is the total work done here. And so the total work that is uh, done on the system is the work done by everything is zero except for the work done by the applied force and the friction. So the total work, work total, is the work of the applied force, which was for reference, F cos theta delta x uh, plus, oops, the work done by friction. Let me uh, actually write this down uh, like this. It is the work done by the applied force plus the work done by friction is equal to F cos theta delta x minus F cos theta delta x, which is known in the business as zero. This is an interesting result. Uh, it shows that despite all of these forces acting on the system, we aren't changing its energy. And that's because the forces are in equilibrium. So important thumb, uh, important uh, rule of thumb comes out of this, which is you can have lots of forces, but unless they are actually contributing positive work to the system, the energy will not change. Uh, we can you do a similar thing as we start to think about this in uh, beyond kind of uh, two dimension or in uh, vector dimensions. Uh, we can just apply the um, the uh, dot product rules in unit vector form, uh, where we are given a loaded uh, shopping cart, uh, where shopping cart went, is rolling across a parking lot in a strong wind. Here's where it went. It went right there. Shopping cart. You apply a constant force, F, uh, to the cart as it undergoes a displacement of delta R uh, uh, of that form. How much does the force... Uh, how much work does the force you apply do on the cart? Well, the displacement, uh, the work done by this force is just F dot delta R, which is the displacement um, that it's going on. Let's give a nice, uh, it's an even worse arrow. Let's try, there we are. And then uh, we just use dot product in uh, unit vector notation. So 40 J uh, Newtons dotted with 9i minus 3j meters, and that's equal to 30 times 9 is 270 minus 40 times 3 minus 120, oop, minus minus is plus uh, Newton meters. And I add those together, and I get that that's 390 Newton meters or joules. So this work does this uh, force, uh, or this, uh, yeah, this work, this force does work on the cart, and it would uh, put 390 joules of energy into the system if it were the only force acting or doing work on the cart. Uh, is this the only force acting on the cart? Well, no, there's probably a normal force in gravity, but I also want to note that there has to be another cart in the, uh, another force in the IJ plane. Uh, because I have a um, sort of coordinate system that looks like this, if this is in the x and then the y direction, uh, this force here is 30i minus 40j. It's kind of going down here. This is the applied force. And then the displacement is 9i minus uh, 3j. And so 9i uh, goes out here, minus 3j goes off in this direction. And so this is the total displacement. And uh, since the force is acting on uh, it, and it's not at 90 degrees or pointing along it, there has to be another force that's producing this displacement uh, and sort of pulling it off in this direction. Otherwise, it would be accelerated over in uh, that direction. Uh, given what we know in the problem. Okay, 
Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is what happens if your force is uh, actually uh, varying uh, with uh, varying with a position. So thus far, we have only dealt with constant forces, and uh, but you know we can think about uh, forces, or you can think about forces uh, and works in terms of the areas under a curve. And if we have a variable force, we can think about the force graphed as a function of position. And a constant force is just a value across here. So the work or uh, times the displacement is just the area in this space under the curve. And if the force is varying with position, then we have the mechanics uh, to actually calculate um, the we have the mechanics to start to calculate the area under the curve using calculus. But I just want to stress that our constant force definition, uh, we can just represent it in this graph and sort of say constant force as a function of position gives me the area under uh, the curve. And you probably know where this is going. If the force is acting in the negative direction with respect to the displacement, we represent that as the force uh, is negative direction in terms of displacement. It's a negative area under the curve. And so the distance that we have here and the distance that we have here are works. This one represents positive work. This one represents negative work. Uh, so this gives us good mechanics for starting to ask, what would happen if we have a varying force along our path? And so we can sort of think about what would happen if we have a um, curve where the force in uh, the x uh, direction is changing in magnitude and we moved it across uh, this full displacement. Well, we would then need to add up the little contributions of work from every little interval along here, uh, every little x1, x2, x3, uh, which is really the tools that we get out of calculus. So we would want to say uh, that we would just add up all this area under the curve to calculate the total amount of work. So uh, I'll stress that since what this is representing is the force in the component uh, or in the direction of the uh, displacement, the uh, ver this variation can happen if the force changes along the path for some reason, or the angle between the force and the displacement changes. Uh, and that'll give us this variation. And once we have that, we have the tools that we need to invoke calculus. And so we think about taking the work as adding up this little area and that little area and that little area all the way on up to give us a sum. And of course, as we make those little intervals really tiny, we encounter the, the, the core, cal, uh, core definition of an integral in calculus. So uh, here we can think about the work done on the system as the integral from the starting point to the ending point of the force in the direction of the displacement in terms of a tiny little displacement delta x. And this is really neat because it allows us to finally connect the ideas of work with the ideas of energy. And to think about that in the integral sense, what we can finally do with this calculus definition of work is write down the work energy theorem, which allows us to relate our calculus definition of work to how a system's energy actually changes. So what we have is uh, I'm going to start out with F equals MA. So I have an F equals MA, and I'm going to integrate both sides of that equation from zero to a displacement S uh, with respect to dx. And so zero to S, and that's it. So this is just a uh, spatial integration of Newton's second law. And just sort of consider the forces over the moving from start to finish. And so what I'm going to do is you might recognize the left-hand side as what I've been talking about. This is just the work. That's how we have been defining that for the system. And then on the right, you might sort of recognize this little part, A times the displacement, as something that we have uh, used the chain rule to find. In particular, back in part one, we made the assertion that this allows us to write A times dx is equal to v dot dv, which was a change of variables rules that we proved back in part one. And I'm going to just use that now. This is totally a 
week of cashing in those checks, zero to S, uh, M mass times V dot DV. And if I change variables, I actually should be careful and say that this is the initial velocity, zero, V zero, and this is the final velocity at position S because we're actually going to move into treating it uh, in terms of S. Uh, so then we just get the work on one side of the equation. And then uh, on the other side, we get a fairly simple integral. I'm going to shift this to be my initial and my final velocities of v dot v dv. And I know how to integrate v. Uh, that is 1 half m times v squared evaluated from vi to vf. And that is 1 half m v final squared minus 1 half m the initial squared, which is what I will call energy. It's a specific kind of energy, and I bet you you've heard of this before. So this is the change in kinetic energy for the system, where 1 half mv squared is what I will call the kinetic energy of the system. Something you know about. So this is has units of joules, has work, and so this really solidifies the perspective that we've been building, which is that the work changes the energy of the system, and for what we're talking about, it's really the kinetic energy of the system. Now, I just want to stress that this expansion also works in vectors along trajectories, and so we can use the idea that f dot ds uh, has a vector component. I'm going to go along a path from 0 to s, and I'm going to do the same thing, 0 to s of ma uh, dotted with some differential vector, uh, ds. And so the ds we already have an uh, exp uh, expression for, which is the velocity vector uh, over time. That's the displacement times time. And we've gone ahead and we know that that's equal to the speed of the particle times the unit vector in the tangent direction times dt. Now, I've used just n and t before, but I'm going to give a little variable. I'm going to note that u of t is what I would, in a less complicated situation, just call t. This is the tangent unit vector. And that tangent unit vector uh, is just, uh, I'm leaving it as uh, u sub t because we also have a time running around in the problem. And that's going to get mm, real nasty real quick if we just ignore it, uh, if we ignore it. Now, we know from dot products that f sub t, uh, f, we're going to take f dot ds. So that's f t, oops, uh, u t hat plus the normal component times the normal vector, and we're going to dot that with um, v times u of t hat dot dt. And when I do that, I just get the components in front of uh, this. So I get that this is 0 to s of f dot v uh, dt, um, or the uh, uh, basically, the tangent component, 0 to s, of f of t dot ds uh, along the path, which is the work. So in, critically, the normal component of the uh, force doesn't contribute because we only consider the contribution along the path. So coming back and picking up the right-hand side of the equation, I write down that m uh, a for this, I can write the, this down as m integral, 0 to s of uh, a of t, t uh, u of t hat, uh, plus a sub n of u n hat, uh, dotted with v dot uh, u of t dt. Uh, and this gives us the same expression uh, where we get m integral, and then I'm going to write the a of t as dv by dt, that's the change in speed of the system, uh, times v dot dt. And so uh, in change of variables, we get back to m integral v dot dv, and that gives us our 1 half mv squared evaluated from the initial to the final speeds. 
and that's the change in kinetic energy. So the construction that we've set up by essentially arguing that the speed uh, is what's important uh, and what is changed by the tangential force, uh, it, it, so only the component of the force along the trajectory is what gives us the work energy theorem in two, three, 10 dimensions. Uh, so the math looks the same uh, because of the way that we've set up these normal tangential uh, components and it just kind of, you know, falls into place. So it's really pretty amazing. So let's do a case of work energy theorem in high dimensions. Uh, in this case, we have a force that is acting on a little collar that's like a little ring that goes around a tube or, or a wire. Uh, and that wire is this gray line here, and it's a semi or a quarter circle. Uh, the collar here is this little uh, C A uh, mass and has a force that is acting on it and with a magnitude of five dimensions at an angle of phi equals 30 degrees above the horizontal. So this angle here is 30 degrees. Okay, what we want to do is determine the speed of the collar when it goes from zero degrees down to 45 degrees. So this is our final position here. And so the mechanics of having a known path start to help us out here. So first off, we have to think about the forces acting on the system. Well, there's clearly a force F. So the force acting on the system, there's going to be a force uh, and then draws a vector and that's F cos phi i hat plus F sine phi j hat, where the phi is the 30 degrees and F equals 5.0 newtons. Excellent. Uh, so then the next thing I have to worry about is gravity. So mg for this system is just mg j hat. And I'm going to define my coordinate system to be the usual one, x, y. So this is negative. It's pointed downward. And so it's going to actually probably help as this color slides down here. And we want to figure out uh, the contributions of these two forces. Well, this is a little tricky because we need to come up with an expression for ds, which is the displacement along the path. And to do that, we need to describe where the particle is when it is on a circular path. So this is a general form that is going to show up and I'm going to sort of work through it in a bit of detail and then use this mechanics again in the future. So first off, I want to note that the position of the collar, I'm going to define an origin here, uh, down at the bottom, and then the position of the collar is its x component, which is going to basically be the radius of the collar, which is, I'm going to give it a big R, is 0.2 meters, that's given in the problem. Uh, so it's going to start out at x equals zero, and then it's going to increase uh, and this component here is its x-coordinate, and that's equal to the sine of the angle. So it's going to be r times sine theta i hat, okay, plus r cos theta j hat, which is this component right here. Okay, so that's its coordinate vector. And I want to think about where that coordinate vector is a little while later. So I'm going to be specific. I'm going to call this r at theta. Now I'm going to consider what r at theta plus delta theta is. And I'm going to assume that delta theta is small. It's going to allow us to get away with murder. And by murder, I mean killing off trigonometric terms. So uh, just by the same logic that I used over here, uh, what's happening here is we get that this is R of sine theta plus delta theta plus R of cos theta plus delta theta j hat. Next, what I want to do is uh, note that this, uh, these two expressions are sum uh, sum uh, trig identities, and so I can come over here and I note that r at theta plus delta theta 
is going to be equal to r. I'm just going to pull it out of the whole bracket on this here. And that's going to be sine theta cos delta theta uh, plus cos theta sine delta theta. I had to go and look up all these trig identities to work this math out. So this is just the sum trig functions. Uh, so that's great. And this is all in the i hat direction. Uh, plus we have uh, cos theta cos delta theta uh, minus sine theta sine delta theta in the j hat direction. And then the final piece that I'm going to use here is that for small angles, for small delta theta, here's the murder, small delta theta, and this is key, theta in radians. And that's so important that I'm going to use an infrequently used tool, the highlighter. Ooh. Theta in radians. I can write down an approximate expression for sines and cosines. I'm going to approximate the cosine of delta theta as being approximately equal to 1 minus delta theta squared over 2, but we're going to assume that it's really small, and I'm going to say that's approximately equal to 1, because uh, a tiny number squared is really tiny. And then I'm going to say sine delta theta is approximately equal to theta. So this is something that we will explore more as you get farther on in your calculus course. This occurs from the Taylor series expansion, or Taylor-McLaurin expansion, of cosine and sine around uh, small angles of delta theta, uh, or so near zero. And it's an approximation we use in physics all the time. So this is the first time, and I have to swap it, state without proof, but we will get to it a little later as you go through your calc class. So trust me for now, Math 144 is going to totally fix your business here. Okay, uh, so that's the approximation we're going to use, and then we're going to write down r at theta plus delta theta minus r at theta, and that's going to be equal to my small displacement delta s or ds. Uh, and so when I do that, I'm going to use my trig uh, approximations, and I'm going to write down from these two expressions here and here. And so uh, let's do that. So we get r at theta. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, I'm just going to write these out now. So I'm going to say that's r, big r, out in front of literally everything. And then I get uh, sine theta times cos delta theta. So I'm going to, let me just write my approximations and where they go on up here. So this I'm going to approximate as 1. This I'm going to approximate as delta theta. This I'm going to approximate as 1. And this I'm going to approximate as delta theta. And what we get is, uh, coming back to the proper color, uh, sine theta plus cos theta times delta theta minus sine theta, all in the i hat direction, uh, plus, then we take cos theta, cos theta, uh, minus sine theta delta theta, minus, uh, what is over here? Uh, up here, uh, it's cos theta. Cos theta all in the j hat direction. And what's neat about this is that the leading terms cancel out, uh, and we are left with an expression for ds. So now we have our ds is equal to r times cos theta, and I'm going to pass into the limit d theta, haha, <laughs> got tiny on you, uh, minus r sine theta d theta j hat. And mathematically, this makes ton of sense because I can do this on this uh, expression here, get a little cleaner. Let's wipe this all out. If we think about what's happening here to the trajectory as this particle moves down a little increment ds, 
what's happening is that at, depending on angle, it's going to drop down by a little bit. So it's going to be going towards negative y and a little bit in negative x. And it's going to move by an angle uh, that is going to depend uh, here, dot, 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 on this angle here, theta, which is this angle there, theta. And so the components of that, negative sine theta and cos theta, give us the results that we're looking for. So a little displacement and angle, d theta, is going to move us along this trajectory there. So that makes total mathematical sense for our force displacement. Now, with this nice little derivation behind us, we are ready to calculate some work. So let us get to work. Oops. Let us try this again. Copy. I did it. OK. So coming back here, um, we're going to uh, hop on up, and we are going to clear out all of the math and get back to the physics. So let's get back all the way to here. This is all a purpose of deriving uh, what ds is. And then I'm going to pop that result in again, which I mean that. And paste. And I'm going to get a little bit of an extra mess, which we are going to totally just clean up. OK, so let's do some integration. Uh, we are going to calculate the work. Uh, and that's going to be the integral of vector f dot vector ds. We have an expressions for all of those. And so we can write that down. Uh, we've got integral. Um, so we're going to get specific now. We're going to go from 0 to pi over 4, which is the mathematician's way of saying 45 degrees. And we're doing integral, so we better be radian style. Uh, and then we're going to do the dot product of, uh, let's see here, f dot ds. So that's going to be f cos phi times r cos theta d theta, and that's in the i direction, so that's the dot product of this component with this component. And then we're going to add to that the integral from 0 to pi over 4 of f cos sine sine by uh, minus mg times uh, negative r sine theta d theta. And now we have a proper integral that we can do. So we're going to pull this all out, and we're going to do f cos phi uh, times r integral from 0 to pi over 4 of uh, cos theta d theta plus f sine phi uh, minus mg times negative r times the integral from 0, that's pi over 4, 0 to pi over 4 of sine theta d theta. And these, uh, at this point, we should sort of be getting familiar with the idea. Uh, hopefully, Math 144 has taught you uh, that the derivative with respect to theta of sine theta is cos theta, and d by d theta of cos theta is equal to negative sine theta. Again, all radian mode. And so uh, when I take the antiderivative of cos theta, I will get two sine theta. And so that's r f cos phi times the sine of theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 4. Awesome, amazing, adequate, uh, times f sine phi minus mg times negative r times uh, I go from uh, sine theta, negative sine theta becomes cos theta, so this becomes negative cos theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 4. And then I just get some more math. Let's do that more math. So it's r f cos phi times sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2 minus 0 is nothing. Uh, plus f times sine 
phi minus mg times negative times negative is a positive r times the cos of theta at pi over 4 is uh, root 2 over 2. Cool. Uh, and cos of theta at 0 is 1 minus 1. And so this is our analytic expression. We've evaluated this over the path. And now we can plug in some numbers. And so if we do that, uh, we will get that uh, this is, um, uh, let's see here, it is, let's uh, go back and actually copy it so it's clear what we have. Let's see if I can successfully do this without taking 6,000 minutes. Okay, good enough. Copy, copy, got it. Hop on over here. Paste. Oh, we did it, sort of. So this is our total work. Good enough. Let's get big, too big, uh, and say, okay, uh, so we say that R is 0 0.2 meters, F is 5 newtons, cos phi is cos of 30 degrees, which is root 3 over 2 times root 2 over 2, plus, again, 5 newtons times sine of 30 degrees, which is a half, minus M, which was 0 0.5 kilograms, times g, that's going to be 10 today, meter per second squared, all times 0 0.5, um, oh, no, 0 0.2 meters, all times root 2 over 2 minus 1. And uh, if we grind this whole mess out, we get the work is equal to 1.46 joules. And that's going to be the change in the kinetic energy for the system, which is going to be starting at uh, whatever the speed is at 45 degrees minus starting at rest. So the speed is zero. And then uh, solving there, uh, so we get two times 1.46 joules over the mass of the system, which is 0 0.5 kilograms, uh, times all square root, gives me the speed, and the answer there is 2.42 meters per second. Pretty wild. The whole point of going through that wasn't necessarily to impress you with my ability to integrate trig functions, but it was mostly to illustrate what the how we treat motion along a path. And a circular path is an incredibly common path uh, that we'll deal with. And so we will use this relationship that we can figure out the um, displacement vectors for these two uh, components in terms of a vector uh, separation. And these trig functions uh, will use that a lot uh, to figure out what our circular path is. And then we just follow through. We carry out the dot product integrate over the angle, do some calculus, feel great about ourselves, and get out our final speed. But the key point there is using the circular path. Okay, so that was um, the case where the changing direction of the force uh, led to a variable work required a calcu uh, calculation. Uh, we can also have the case where the changing magnitude of the force leads to a change in um, it leads to a change in the um, uh, requires calculus. So uh, another uh, case, the, the most common case we have for dealing with this is the case of a spring, which is why we introduced it a little early last uh, time. Uh, and now we actually have the magnitude of force is uh, a spring constant times a displacement, which varies. So it will vary over a path, you know, compress or shrink. You're going to have a different force at different positions here. Uh, so I've written down the magnitude here, and I just want to stretch that, stress that the force is always the opposite direction of the spring stretching or compression and the answer is just put the right sign in given your free body diagram uh, but it's opposite the displacement um, or it's opposite the direction that your um, uh, spring moves relative to its equilibrium point. Uh, okay, so uh, in this case we can think about what the force is acting on this block 
So we imagine we have a spring here. We take a block and we compress it from equilibrium. And so the free body diagram of the Hooke law force acting on it is in the opposite direction of the displacement. And so at that case, we can write down what the force is. Uh, so it's just F is equal to K, negative K, X minus X naught. The displacement's in the positive direction, so delta X. So we can imagine the work done by a spring force uh, geometrically in terms of our uh, area under the curve. And so we can think about this force going, uh, going, becoming negative and uh, dropping down here as we go from x naught to x. And then we have an uh, idea that this is the area under the curve. And so we can figure out that this is x naught uh, to, or x to x naught is a displacement of s. And then we go to the height of the end, which is ks. And, you know, basically by geometry, you could argue that this area is a triangle. It's a half base times height. So the work must be equal to one half k uh, s squared, where s is the total displacement. Now, we, I just want to stress that this also squares with treating our limits carefully in terms of the calculus, because it can calculate this here, uh, k minus k x minus x naught uh, dx, and actually execute this integral, and I better get an equivalent answer. So uh, if I do that, I'm just going to split this up. I'm going to say that this is the integral from x naught to x of minus kx dx, and then a negative negative becomes a plus kx naught dx from x naught dx. And then I'm going to actually execute this integral. So this is minus k. Integral of x is x squared. So it's going to be x squared over 2 evaluated from x naught to x uh, plus uh, kx naught integral of dx is just x integrated from x naught to x. Uh, I'll plug those in. I'll come on up here and I get that this is equal to minus one half kx squared uh, minus a negative plus one half kx naught squared, cool, uh, plus kx naught x minus kx naught squared, which is evaluating the second terms here. And so this is uh, added in here. And uh, so what we can look at here is we see that this kx naught term adds together with this plus one half kx naught term here. And so then I get that this is minus one half k, and I'll pull this all out, x squared, um, pull out a negative sign, minus uh, two x naught x plus x naught squared or minus one half k times x minus x naught quantity squared. And that uh, is uh, essentially the exact same thing as what happened up here. So I'm going to argue it's equivalent. We didn't get the same sign because I didn't take into account that this was under the curve. Uh, and then x minus x naught is what I'm calling s. So these are indeed equivalent. And I just wanted to show you that uh, the algebra of this works out if we treat this part carefully. Okay, so let's apply a Newton, uh, a work energy problem to a case of a spring. Um, we're going to actually use a slightly different spring and apply the uh, same principles that we derive for Hooke's law here in the case where we have a spring that follows a different uh, force law. It is going to go like the force is some constant times the cube root of the displacement here. So it's going to be kind of a weird little uh, force, uh, but I just want to show you that the same principle applies. So what's going to happen is we're going to compress a block uh, with a mass of 20 kilograms on this nonlinear spring to shrink it down a displacement of 0.2 meters. Uh, the force in the spring is then negative because it's going to be pointing upward uh, this constant s to the one third, where s is given in meters and is measured downward, determine the speed of the cylinder just after it moves away from the spring at s equals zero, take g as 10 meters per second squared. So this is a work energy problem where the work uh, on the problem, or the cylinder, is going to produce a change in kinetic energy. That work is going to come from two forces, the spring force pushing upward 
and then mg pulling downward. So it's going to be the work from the spring plus the work from gravity. We are defining our positive direction going downward in this case so that our force law works out. And so what we're going to be going, uh, what we're doing is uh, the force dotted into the displacement is going to run uh, a, it is negative, um, and it's going to be this force law, we'll call it k times s to the one third from uh, starting at s up to zero ds. And then we have our gravity, which is just plus mg ds running from s uh, to zero. So the, D, uh, the direction is taken care of in the bounds of the integral here. So we start, low, uh, start at low s and go to high s. This is the force in the coordinate system. mg gets a positive sign because weight is pointed downward in the coordinate system. Uh, so uh, given that, we can do some math. So then uh, the integral of s to the one-third is three-fourths s to the four-third. And so this becomes minus k times s to the four-thirds. And then there's a three-fourths in front. Let me just put some brackets around that and indicate that we're going from s to zero. Uh, plus um, m g s uh, it, it, it is constant. So it's the integral of ds from s to zero. And so we plug in here. This is minus 3 fourths uh, k times zero to the four thirds minus s to the four thirds plus m g times zero minus s. And this all comes out, negative, uh, the zero goes away. And so we get 3 fourths k s to the four thirds minus m g s. So this makes sense uh, in terms of the signs that we got out of it. The 3 fourths k s to the four thirds is the energy injected into the system by the spring launch. And then the minus m g s is the work done by gravity as it rises up uh, from the bottom to the top. And then we just put in some numbers. So this is 3 fourths uh, times the spring constant, which is 1,000 newton meter to the minus one third times uh, the displacement, which is 0 0.2 meters to the four thirds minus m, that's 20 kilograms, times g, which is 10 meters per second squared, times the displacement, which is 0 0.2 meters. And uh, we push that all out and get 47.7 joules. And then if we write down that the speed is root two times k over the mass of the object, which is two times um, the 47.7 joules, all over the mass of the object, 0 0.2, uh, sorry, 20 kilograms. In this one, it's 20 kilograms. Uh, and divide that all out, we get 2.18 meters per second, as desired. So good job, us. All right, uh, the, I want to talk about two final subjects uh, today, uh, the first of which is um, the idea of power. And so this power, uh, the idea of power is to think about which of these two ramps is it easiest for us to put a little mass and push it on up the ramp? Is it easier to do it uh, from this shallow ramp or this slightly steeper ramp? Well, in both cases, uh, the amount of work that's required to push it up there against gravity is the same because they have the same height. And therefore, the work you have to put into them uh, only matters in the vertical direction. The component along the horizontal uh, it, it ends up you know, not mattering because it is frictionless. So the work ends up being the same, but you would obviously look at this and say, well, the uh, steeper ramp will be harder. And what that is, is it's encompassing the idea that you would do it over a shorter period of time. And so implicitly, you just sort of think about how much more force you'd have to push to lift it up there in a shorter tra uh, trajectory. And so that's where we get this idea of, you know, we, we just work alone in the physics sense isn't enough to explain a scenario. 
and instead we introduce the idea of power, which is the rate at which energy is transformed or that work is done. And we consider the average power to be the work done over the uh, change uh, over a interval of time that that force does some work. So we sort of think about this as uh, work over the time interval and the time interval uh, and so the time interval that we often standardize to is a second and so we usually consider one joule per second is one watt and that has units of kilogram meter squared per second cube just a compound unit and if you look at power ratings of computer power supplies or light bulbs often stamped right on top of them is their wattage which is the electrical power draw that they uh, pull out of the wall uh, to give off uh, radiation in the case of uh, light so you know stamped right there on the surface how much work is how much energy is being drawn per unit time by that electrical device. Uh, and what's kind of interesting is that your power uh, bill can actually encompass a, um, uh, it, it, can, it tells you how much energy you use. And it comes in these weird units, which are kilowatt hours. And so if I had my household power use was 428 kilowatts, well, that's about 10 to the three watts. Uh, times an hour, which is 3,600 seconds, a kilowatt hour is 3.6 megajoules. So you're actually being uh, billed in units of 3.6 uh, uh, megajoules per whatever the cost is. And you can tell this is an old power bill because it only costs eight cents per kilowatt hour uh, here. And that gave me a power bill here. This number is very different right now. Uh, so it's kind of interesting if you think about this. I like to parameterize that a kilowatt hour is about 860 kilocalories, uh, which is uh, basically I discovered the uh, energy in a Subway double meatball marinara. And so essentially, uh, if you could convert electrical energy into uh, Subway sandwiches, you would do it at eight cents per Subway sandwich, which is kind of interesting. Uh, anyways, uh, all of that energy comes into my house and electricity and does work in various uh, ways. It gives off radiation in the form of light bulbs. It uh, turns fans, uh, etc. So all of this energy is just conveniently moving through and doing work uh, throughout my house. Um, another interesting note is that the imperial units of power are the horsepower, kind of makes sense. And uh, one horsepower is about 746 watts, but because imperial conventions can't keep anything straight, there are actually five separate conventions for uh, horsepower uh, use, depending on the context. And uh, a, a typical vehicle that you drive uh, has about 90,000 watts of power output, which is a lot of force in relatively short periods of time. Uh, I note that if you have a force in translational equilibrium, that you can figure out the power as the force dotted with the velocity vector. Uh, and that just comes from the work divided by the time, and then you say delta x over delta t is a speed, and so that gives you uh, f dot v, and so your power is the force times uh, the velocity, or force dotted with the velocity gives you a power, also a scalar quantity here. Okay. Uh, brief aside about power, uh, the most important equation in power is usually this f dot v, so that it allows us to figure out uh, forces and speeds given input powers or how much power is required to maintain a force, uh, an object in equilibrium moving at speed v. Uh, the final thing is to just note and sort of set up something for next week where we want to note that some forces exert work in a way that is path dependent and some uh, exert uh, work in a way that is path independent. And what we do is we divide forces into two categories. One is path dependent, where it depends on how you get from point A to point B. And the other is path independent, and it doesn't matter how you get from point A to point B, only where point A and point B are. A path dependent force is called a non-conservative force, and a path 
independent force is called conservative. We'll dive into what makes a uh, force conservative versus non-conservative a little more next week, but I want to get a dive in what does it mean to be path dependent versus independent. So I want to consider this little example. I have a hippopotamus that's attached to a spring with a constant of 5,000 newtons per meter. The hippo moves along the ground with a coefficient of kinetic friction of 0.5. So that's down here. How much work is done on the hippo by the spring to compress it to one meter and assume that g is 10 meters per second squared? Well, the work done by a spring is one half k x minus x naught squared. And so that's one half times 5,000 newtons per meter times x minus x naught is one meter quantity squared or 2,500 joules. That's the magnitude of the work that is done on the system. I will note that if I'm compressing the force, uh, the uh, force goes in, uh, the displacement goes in this direction, delta x. The force opposes my motion, that's f, and so the work here should be negative. And I'm sticking in the negative because force dot, uh, force dotted with the displacement is negative f delta x times uh, cosine of 180 degrees. So sorry, it's not negative that, it is just that. And that is equal to negative f dot delta x. So it makes sense does negative 2,500 joules of work on the hippo. If we want to move the hippo, we have to do work on the system to push it, uh, to compress it. Well, how much work is done to return the hippo to the equilibrium position? Well, in this case, we have a force going in this direction. We have a displacement going in this direction. So it's going to be positive work. And so the work here is one half k delta x squared again, and that's just going to be the 2,500 joules. Uh, and it's going to be positive. So it's kind of interesting here that if I go, if I compress, that takes 2,500 joules of energy. And then if I release, that gives me plus 2,500 joules of energy. And I return to where I started, add these all up, I get zero. So if I make a round trip, this force does no net work on the hippo. Let's contrast that with the friction. Well, in this case, I have a displacement that goes this way, and I get a friction force that goes in the opposite direction. So the work will be equal to negative, because it's opposite the trajectory, times the uh, force, which is going to be mu k m g times the displacement, delta x, and I'll stick in those values, minus 0 0.5 times the mass of the hippo, which is 1,000 kilograms, times 10 meters per second squared, times 1 meter, and that gives me minus 5,000 joules. Okay? Great. Well, what about going back in the opposite direction? Well, in that case, uh, my displacement goes this way and my friction goes in the opposite direction. So again, my work is going to be minus mu k m g times delta x, which is just minus 5,000 joules. So if we execute uh, during the compression phase, we get minus 5,000 joules. And then we uh, expand and return to equilibrium position. That also takes minus 5,000 joules. And so if we add these together, we get 10,000 joules. And so you can see that if I push the, for, uh, the hippo against friction going one way and I push back, I don't get the energy back out of friction. So the friction is what we call a non-conservative force, because if we make a round trip and come back to where we started, we don't get the energy out that we put back in. So I want to hold this idea of the path and path independence kind of in our heads as we go into the next week 
and we discuss uh, the ideas of potential energy and the ideas of conservative forces. So that's all for this week. Um, I'll talk to you in class.